Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. Well, we heard the sentence today. Uh, Jennifer and James Crumley, whose son killed four people, each faced up to 15 years in prison for involuntary manslaughter convictions. Jennifer and James Crumbly, who were convicted of involuntary manslaughter, failing to prevent their teenage son from killing four students in the deadliest school shooting in Michigan's history, were each sentenced on Tuesday to 10 to 15 years in prison. Their separate jury trials ended in guilty verdicts in February and March, making them the first parents in the country to be convicted over the deaths caused by their child in a mass shooting. Involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty in Michigan of up to 15 years in prison. And prosecutors asked in sentencing memos filed to the court last week that the Crumleys each serve at least 10 years. Both have been in jail for more than two years while awaiting trial and will receive credit for the time served. You know, this is really a case where it's sort of unprecedented and we're going to go into the legal aspects of it as well as the parenting aspects and how we feel about this how the victims families feel about this but this is territory right now that is unknown and for one of the the, the reasons that could be ripe for an appeal but we will see it's too early to start talking appeal well already of course the defense attorneys are talking that however for the bigger picture, we come up with a term, and we'll discuss this, of vicarious liability. So folks, hold on to your seats, hold on to your hats. You're about to enter true crime from a police perspective. You're about to enter the off-the-cuff zone, the police off-the-cuff zone. There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir. They have the car stopped in Tampa Ranch, Michael We still don't know who pulled the trigger. You know, we hear that we spoke about that term vicarious liability. Uh, and according to the judge, Judge Cheryl Matthews, parents are not expected to be psychic. Uh, but these convictions are not about poor parenting. These convictions confirm repeated acts or lack of acts that could have halted an oncoming runaway train, repeatedly ignoring things that would make a reasonable person feel the hair on the back of her neck stand up. Before the hearing, prosecutors said that Miss Crumley, 46 years old, was asking to be sentenced to house arrest on her defense lawyer's property rather than serving prison time. And Mr. Crumley said that he had been wrongfully convicted and his sentence should mount to the time he had already served in prison, adding that he felt absolutely horrible about what had happened. On Tuesday, each of them spoke in the hearing before the judge pronounced sentence. I stand to, not to ask for your forgiveness, as I know it may be beyond reach, but to express my sincerest apologies for the pain that has been caused, Ms. Crumbly said in court, addressing the relatives of the students who were killed. So with that in mind, I'm going to bring on a very special guest one that you guys have seen before, one who's very popular with my audience, and she happens to be a criminologist, and she teaches at St. Thomas University in Miami, a nice place to be if you have to teach, right, if you want to teach. Welcome to the show, Dr. Debbie Goodman. Debbie, Dr. Debbie, welcome. Thank you so much, Sergeant Bill and, and the wonderful viewers. I'm, I'm always delighted and honored to join you, and, you know, you're the 
you're the captain steering this ship. And I know we're in for a real treat for um, today's conversation. And I'm certainly honored to be on board with you. So thank you for having me. Well, Dr. Debbie, you know, one of the things about this case, and I think, you know, when you find out what this kid was doing, he was 15 years old, right? And his father buys him a nine millimeter pistol for his birthday. Uh, not just a, any kind of pistol, a six hour, which is like the Mercedes Benz of nine millimeters. And I question that also. I mean, first of all, if you're going to give a 15 year old a gun, shouldn't you be keeping it in the, a safe and controlling the access to it and maybe taking him to a range and having him trained by professionals right there? I think that's pretty bad parenting. Your thoughts? Absolutely. And, and, you know, we appreciate always the role of the parent. I'm the proud mom of two sons. I know you're a parent, our viewers are our parents and grandparents. And so we take that role seriously. It, it, it's a gift to be a parent, right? And, and to have influence and guide and advise our children every step of the way. So you're absolutely right to place a gun of that magnitude into the hand of a 15 year old. And again, Sergeant Bill, he's not meaning Ethan Crumley, just a 15 year old. We're gonna peel back the levels and layers of him, but this is a disturbed young man. You know, there's documentation, there's verification, there's evidence of his mental health compromise and challenges that he experienced to include um, being forthcoming with his mother about hearing and seeing demons and ghosts. And he's uh, known to have made Molotov cocktails and he's known to have experimented with the um, harm to animals whereby he decapitated a bird and put the bird's head in a jar. So we're really talking about somebody who's already demonstrate um, concerning conduct. So what this father, James Crumley, was thinking, and you're right too, there was absolutely nothing that we know of that's been verified as to training, uh, you know, on a firing range or what the point of even why there might be a gun in the household for, for safety for the home, but absolutely zero security and, and no responsibility or reliability demonstrated as far as we know by either Mr. or Mrs. Crumley. You know, Dr. Debbie, even the gun the gun advocates, the NRAP, you're not hearing from them on this case. So I got to think that they must somewhat agree. I mean, it's not a good look. It's not uh, very smart to get, first of all, against giving a gun to a 15-year-old that he has access to. Second of all, when the 15-year-old is mentally ill and having mental problems, then I got to look at the parents. And I really have to say, what the hell is going on here? I want to play this from News Nation. To follow that breaking news, is history made today. The parents of Michigan school shooter Ethan Crumbly have both been sentenced. James and Jennifer Crumbly both sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison. News Nation's Kelly Beeson has been monitoring today's hearing and joins us live. Yeah, so Nicole, the judge in this case says she took into consideration the deaths of the four students killed and the seven wounded as well. Both were found guilty, the parents, of four counts of involuntary manslaughter in historic trials earlier this year. And they are the first parents to be held criminally responsible for a mass school shooting brought on by the child of the families. Now, the families of the four victims, Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meir, Justin Schilling, and Madison Baldwin, they were all in the courtroom for this sentencing, each addressing the judge, reiterating that the Crumleys failed as parents and should be sentenced to the maximum of 15 years in prison. Just before sentencing, both Crumleys expressed their regrets for their son's actions. Never think this could not happen to you and stereotype that bad kids come from bad parents. The prosecution has tried to mold us into the type of parents society wants to believe are so horrible, only a school or mass shooter could be bred from. This is a very <coughs> assumption to have. We were good parents. We were the average family. We weren't perfect, but we loved our son and each other tremendously. 
I am sorry for your loss as a result of what my son did. I cannot express how much I wish that I had known what was going on with him or what was going to happen because I absolutely would have done a lot of things differently. Now, during today's hearing, many new developments were brought to light, including the prosecution's allegations that James threatened the lead prosecutor while on a recorded line in custody. His attorney said that he knew he was being recorded and he was venting, but the judge said that they were indeed threats. So both Jennifer and James Crumley, they've already served about two and a half years since their arrest. That time served will be credited towards their sentencing today, Nicole. Yeah. So... I could see that our chat is starting to heat up because the concept, Dr. Debbie, of vicarious liability, and basically what that is, is that the law holds someone else legally responsible for damages caused by another. So now we as parents, we have to be, what is the level of negligence that will enable the law to hold us liable for the actions, say, of, of our children. And we mentioned something also um, in the Madeline Soto case. I mentioned it over and over again in regards to Jennifer Soto. Omission. What is omission? And simply, it's the legal obligation to act, and you fail to do so when legally you are required to act. This could fit vicarious liability, and this could fit omission. You didn't act and you knew your son was crazy. Well, I don't want to use that term crazy. Let's say use mentally ill. It's a little softer term. But you bought him a gun. He showed signs of mental illness and you bought him a gun. There it, it is. <laughs> there it is, Sergeant Bill. I mean, as always, you're you're right to the point and 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 on point. That's it, right there. And then um, you know. The, the failure to act, the omission, is just as important as the actions that are so, un, you know, fathomable. Again, who's putting the gun into the hand of the 15-year-old who is not well? So here could be part of the discussion where we invite the viewers for their thoughts, too. To what degree do we want to hold parents accountable for the wrongful actions of their children? Now we look directly at Mr. and Mrs. Crumley. If Mrs. Crumley is the mother and is receiving direct text messages from her son, you know, speaking about seeing ghosts and demons and, 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 and the experimentation with animal cruelty and writing in notebooks, um, images and visuals of killing others, what more do we need? than to put the child in the car and drive at high rate of speed and get him therapy and counseling and on some kind of medicinal program. None of this happened. No, but you know, I think Dr. Debbie, people are seeing the law in a broader sense. And for example, uh, and I'll play this later on, uh, one of the um, talking heads on Fox said that, what if, a you know, a bartender serves someone, they're drunk, and they go out and they kill someone with their car. Are we extending it back to this bartender that he serves someone perhaps that was drunk? And that's a whole other question, too, because how do you tell when someone's drunk? Do you have a breath of life? You know, it's not a foolproof way for a bartender or any human being to say someone's drunk. Someone could be totally drunk and you, you can't tell. Or someone can look, appear drunk and not be drunk. So... Right. Slippery but slope. Slippery but, slope, Sergeant Bill. But as parents, do we or do we not know if there's a concern about our children? You know, I do a lot of public speaking here in Florida at the at the schools, at the parent teacher meetings. And, and basically, you know, I just suggest to parents that we, we all parents, we cannot be the ostrich with the head in the sand and think not my kid, not my household, not my neighborhood, not my community. No, we're doing the child a disservice. So if there is something that 
you know, gives us pause, I think it has to be explored. You know, Dr. Debbie, I, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate here too, but I know when, when I, my kids grew up, both my wife and I had very serious jobs. And a lot of times they were either left with au pairs when they were very young or when they got teenage years, we had to leave them alone a lot. And they were, we gave them money and we left them food or whatever, because it was so important for us, of course, to make a living and to provide them with a good life. And I can see that too, where you get, well, oh, you weren't taking care of your kids. Well, I was, I was trying to in the 21st century way of both trying to supervise them and, and at the same time giving them a good life by making a good living. True. And I think therein lies the real challenge for many households where parents, I absolutely believe, are trying their best, doing their best amidst their own challenges, of course, of putting food on the table and having jobs and really balancing life and their children's lifestyles. So the best we can do for our children is invest the time, the love, the energy and the care so that they know. But I think a child also knows, Sergeant Bill, when a parent truly cares and there's sincerity and love versus when they feel dismissed, you know, when they feel that the parent would rather be anywhere but with them. And we have read that these particular parents, Mr. and Mrs. Crumley, did leave him alone in very, very young years to go to the bars and, and whatnot. There's allegations of Mrs. Crumley with multiple affairs. And, and we don't know how and if Ethan found out about some of this. So I think the child will always love the parent unconditionally and vice versa. But there has to be the balance of, of love with discipline. 100%. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's unbelievable because I... I I, I sort of appreciate here more than this situation. I think that they uh, absolutely got a just sentence. But I think of the larger scope of applying this law, and that's where I think there's a slippery slope. Let me put the judge on here and hear what she had to say. He was convicted in the school shooting at Oxford, Michigan. Louder and louder and was ignored. No, one's, no one answered. And these two people should have and sure didn't. Mr. Crumley, it's clear to this court that because of you, there was unfettered access to a gun or guns as well as ammunition in your home. You characterized yourself as a martyr and threatened the well-being of the prosecutor. Mrs. Crumley, you glorified the use and possession of these weapons. Your attitude work toward your son and his behaviors was dispassionate and apathetic. Your response to school staff after a 12-minute meeting was, are we done here? During your trial, you announced that you wouldn't do anything different. I understand that that might have been uh, misinterpreted, but it did cut the victims deep. Because of both of your actions and inaction, among many, many other things, the world is missing out on a top the uh, world is missing out on and a top college university will meet out, meet, miss, miss out on Tate's star quality football skills. Um, when I met Raina, who's wise beyond her years, and she's told us that among many, many other things, the community will be denied Hannah's kindness, creativity, and sense of humor. Among many, many other things, the world will miss is Madison's kind and loving soul and the light that reflected her beauty both inside and out. Although a hero in death because of his organ donations that helped so many, we will never know where Justin, an excellent student with vast skills and interests, described as a mentor and a leader, would have left his giant imprint. The impact statements given here and the written statements provided to the court describe the cataclysmic impact the deaths of these children have had on their children. With regard uh, to each defendant, um, this court uh, has spent night and day thinking about this case, as you can imagine. 
I prayed about this case. I thought about this case. And I've considered the possibility for rehabilitation, the need to protect society, the penalty appropriate to the conduct and goal of deterring others from similar, similar conduct. I, re I have reviewed the pre-sentence investigation reports. I am, of course, sadly familiar with the facts and circumstances of these cases, as well as those surrounding each defendant. The advisory sentencing guidelines in this matter do not capture the catastrophic impact of the acts or inaction in, the, in these matters. The guidelines do not take into account the complete lack of insight both defendants have for their behavior to this very day. The guidelines do not account for the severe, severity of the circumstances in this matter. The guidelines ignore the survivors, including shooting victims, B.B. Arthur, Elijah Mueller, Riley Franz, Kylie Osage, John Asciutto, Molly Darnell, and Aiden Watson. They were deeply wounded, both physically and emotionally. You know, I think a lot what the judge is trying to bring out here is that there was four victims who lost their lives, but there were seven wounded. And now take into consideration the impact of that shooting at that school and all the lives that were touched by this and will never be the same after this day. And then she's going into all the things that are not considered in the sentencing. Uh, you know, how the victims feel, how the, the impact statement. She's sentencing based on the law. And one of the things that, that I said earlier on, and I, I, and I think and neither one of us, Dr. Debbie, is an attorney. I wish I had uh, Mike Geary on tonight, but we spoke about vicarious liability, uh, which is at play here. And that's one of the questions I have. Will this case hold up on an appeal? Will it, as you look at the faces of the students, and his, this is with their names, Hannah St. Juliana, age 14, Tate Myra, age 16, Madison Baldwin, age 17, Justin Schillen, age 17. These are the young students who lost their lives. And in addition, there was four, uh, excuse me, seven who were wounded. Now, this is Ethan Crumley on the screen. He was charged with four counts of first-degree murder, seven counts of assault with intent to murder, one count of terrorism causing death, 12 counts of possession of a firearm and the commission of a felony. Uh, he already pled guilty. Now we all look at it as citizens and as parents and as potential victims of some crazy person that goes into a school, a public place, a bus, a concert hall with a firearm and just starts shooting people. And we can clearly say that this 15-year-old had no business having a gun. And then when we think that his parents supplied it for him and after the fact took no responsibility in the outcome of this, that I think infuriates us as citizens, as parents, and we want something done. We want someone punished. Am I speaking for you also, Dr. Debbie? I'm in agreement, Sergeant Bill, and I'm, you know, going back to the judge and some of her points. So really at the forefront of all of this, too, are the four beautiful young lives lost who did nothing wrong. What did they do? All they did was go to school that day and want to learn and interact with their teachers and their fellow students. So when we just look at these beautiful images, as, as heartbreaking as all of this is, seeing that Madison, Tate, Hannah, Justin are no longer with us, we've got to have justice for them. That's our system. That's what you have loved and continue to love all of your years of contribution to the beautiful New York and, and me as a professor in the classroom teaching our young bright minds that we simply cannot allow people to walk around in society and arbitrarily 
um, shoot at, at whim and at their will. So the fact that this young man made the decision, Sergeant Bill, we go back to him as well for, for accountability and reliability and ownership and taking responsibility for this absolutely brutal action that he did not have to do. The fact that he woke up that day in November and went to school with that type of high powered weapon and decided to kill four of his classmates, you know, we'd like to know why, wouldn't we? Why did he do that? He didn't have to do that, but he did. And so we have to hold him accountable first. So I do not disagree with the outcome for him, by the way. I think four counts of first degree murder. This was absolutely planned, premeditated. It was willful. It was with malice. We check all the boxes for him. And it's just astonishing to think that a 15 year old could make that decision, made the decision, went to school and carried it out. I think the outcome for him is accurate. Now the trickle effect, here are the parents. We know it's historic. We know this is a case that will set the tone for more in the future. Your question about will they be successful upon appeal? I mean, it's a maybe. I think it's just too early to tell. I think the world is, is angry about this and angry at Ethan, but he's sentenced. Now the anger toward the parents of how do you put the gun into the hand? How do you dismiss and ignore your son's cries for help and you didn't get him the help and here's the outcome. So we can't ignore, in my opinion, the victimology aspect, that is critical. You know, these four young lives and as you say, the seven, under, uh, seven others who were terribly injured, they deserve justice. 100%, uh, Cheesy Mary from Canada. Maybe if parents were charged for young ones at home with guns, Maybe they will lock their guns up and not going buying their minor a gun. Cheesy Mary, I don't disagree with you. You know, uh, who has mental illness like this? One hundred percent. It seems like they bought him a gun almost like to pacify him, and then just left him and ignored his mental state. Deb Galloway, uh, I have the hope and trust that the law and those who uphold it will only use this as a precedence when truly merited. Well, Deb, it's going to be challenged in the courts. Uh, and you can understand a case like this becomes case law. Absolutely, this will become case law. And if it's successful, if it successfully stands up to an appeal, it will absolutely lay down the law for the entire land, you know. And look, Sandy Hook, someone mentioned Sandy Hook. That's, That's right. right. Adam Lenza. Adam Lenza. Right. The had guns laying around all over the place. That's right. Same thing. Parents put the gun in his hand. That that viewer is absolutely correct. I was going to bring that up too. But she, yeah, she yeah. got the ultimate punishment. She was murdered by him also. She was That's, one of his victims. That's right? right. Simi Sharp. I went to the range as a child with my daddy. and He let me shoot a bit. Never would uh, he have gotten me my own. Well, I think that's – I mean – a 15-year-old has no reason to have a handgun that he carries around with him that he, you know, that he has access to without adult supervision. Tina Powers, it's a shame that they took all of their opportunities away from all of us. What I mean by that, they took four lives away from all of us. We will never know what they would have been. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Deb Galloway, James made a better statement than Jennifer. She didn't have the respect to stand or face the victims but the worst part is she still blamed everyone else, mostly the school. Well, look, I, I think that sometimes uh, parents are more kids than their kids are. You know, they're not mature enough to face the music. Well, she's going to face the music now. She has for over two years. She's been in jail. And now that upon conviction, they'll be going to prison to finish out. Well, they'll do at least eight more years or uh, eight and change because they got a 10 to 15 year sentence. And there was four counts of that sentence, but it was, it was agreed that it would run concurrent. Uh, Richella Pranzo, the counselor who spoke with the boy and didn't check his backpack where the gun was, could have been held responsible for something. He just gave him the bag back and sent him on his way with the gun. Yeah, Richella. Good point. Right. And I, I mean, also like, they found pictures that he had drawn of 
guns and killing people and stuff like that. I mean, that's definitely a red flag, I, I would think. They were there, yeah. Sergeant Bill. The red flags were there. They were, again, dismissed and ignored on this case. Yep. I want to play. This is one of the, the mothers of one of the victims. I want to play with in her impact statement here. We all see things different. Some prioritize and some don't. Accountability can only be given if you actually try it in the first place. As a parent, we all make mistakes. This is a normal way of life. Usually when mistakes happen, we learn from them. We try to fix it or talk it over. But continuing to make the same mistake over and over again is no longer a mistake, it's a choice. That becomes a decision. Those decisions that you made ultimately took my life, my daughter's life because you decided that you didn't want to parent and listen to your son. You took the right away for me to be a mother. You do not get to decide that. You do not get those privileges. You are not above anyone. I love being a mom. It's the one thing that I'm truly great at. You cared more about your well being than the one life that you should put above anyone, your child. And because of that, you took, that you both took four beautiful children away from this world. Being a parent is the best, is the part of life that you should hold to the highest level. It's an honor to be a mother or a father. Even when you think you've done your best, you continue to do more. Unfortunately, you, you never made it to level one. You say you wouldn't do anything different. Well, that really says on what type of parents you are, because there's a lot of things I would do different. But the one thing would, I would have wanted to be different was to take that bullet that day so she could continue to live the life she deserved. You show no remorse, no respect or compassion for our family. The same traits that you've bestowed upon your son the traits that you have torn my family into pieces. To the victims and the families. I stand today not to ask for your forgiveness as I know it may be beyond reach, but to express my sincerest apologies for the pain that has been caused. Your Honor, I don't envy you in the decision you have to make today. I understand the punishment expectations are high from, from all sides. This heartbreaking journey families have endured is more than anyone should have to bear acknowledgement full death. My time in confinement has been filled with deep remorse, regret, and grief over this tragedy. I have taken this one day at a time, trying to survive, navigate, and cope with the endless heartache, pain, and grief I feel for the families of Hannah, Justin, Madison, and Tate. I have also lost myself over my son's wrongdoing. I've been shredded by the public opinion me, shamed as a horrible parent, pained to be a terrible person. But the worst how I carry is my own self-judgment, remorse, and deep regret. The advisory sentencing guidelines in this matter do not capture the catastrophic impact of the acts or inaction in, the, in these matters. The guidelines do not take into account the complete lack of insight both defendants have for their behavior to this very day. The guidelines do not account for the severe, severity of the circumstances in this matter. The guidelines ignore the survivors, including shooting victims, B.B. Arthur, Elijah Mueller, Riley Franz, Kylie Osage, Jonna Shuto, Molly Darnell, and Aiden Watson. They were deeply wounded, both physically and emotionally. In addition to the seven wounded, each of the defendants' gross negligence has caused unimaginable suffering to hundreds of others as a result of what happened that day. Each act or inaction created a ripple effect. Therefore, an out-of-guidelines sentence is appropriate and proportional. The court uses the useful, useful tool of the legislative guidelines, which embody the, the principles of proportionality while also taking into account the nature of the offense and the background of each defendant. I believe that the following sentences would be in the best interest of justice and are reasonable and proportionate to the seriousness of the matter and the circumstances surrounding each defendant. With regard to Jennifer Crumley, 
It is the sense of this court, Ms. Conley, that you served 10 to 15 years with the Michigan Department of Corrections. You will have credit for 858 days. State costs are $272 as a crime victim's rights fee of $130. Um, you and your agents may not have any contact with fam the families of Madison Baldwin, Tate Meir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling. Um, I will issue another ruling with regard to contact um, with your son, the shooter. <coughs> Excuse me. As, as to defendant James Crumley, it is the sentence of this court that you served 10 to 15 years with the Michigan Dep Department of Corrections, that you receive credit for 858 days, that you pay state costs in the matter of uh, $272, that there is a crime victim's rights fee of $130, that you or your agents have no contact with the families of Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Juliana, and uh, Justin Schilling. Well, he gives uh, the um uh, James Crumbly gives his version of uh, I'm sorry, uh, which was both of them were really lacking. I think both of them are sorry that they're going to have to uh, do time in prison. That's what they're really sorry for. I agree. I, I really was disappointed, Sergeant Bill, with Mrs. Crumley sitting there, you know, out of respect, stand up, address the victims, families. Everything was so scripted. And I don't think there was one ounce of remorse other than what you just said for themselves. Yeah. And she had said at an earlier time that um, uh, she wouldn't change anything that she did as if her actions as a parent were fine. If something went wrong elsewhere, not in her parenting. Uh, and I, I think that definitely comes, goes into consideration when a judge is like, wait, you hear them say all the time when a judge sentences someone, you showed no remorse. Judges, juries, uh, people in the courtroom, prosecutors, they want to hear the defendant is remorseful. And when they see no remorse, they really want to just throw the book at that person. And that's what happened. And they did get the maximum penalty. I think it's the right decision um, the remorse is going to come maybe as each one sits for the next 10 to 15 years thinking about it and maybe reflecting on what could they have done differently. And shame on Mrs. Crumley to say she wouldn't have done anything differently. That's just so illogical. How do you say that to grieving parents? Your child killed them. Yeah, uh, Deb Galloway from the chat um James Crumley said there was uh, absolutely no proof in his trial. There was absolutely no proof that Ethan had access to the firearm in his house. What? He used it to do the shootings, didn't he? Deb, you're right, Deb. I mean, people say things that are just outrageous. I want to play this. This was from uh, Fox News. And this touches upon what we spoke about earlier, and that is vicarious liability as well as omission. And the person they have on was a former U.S. attorney. And he's fearful, as I am after I heard this, he's fearful that this could get reversed, that this is unprecedented law, that this law, this conviction may not hold up because of the law. Listen to him. He says it much more eloquently than I possibly could. Sentencing heartbreaking listening to some of the parents um, in that courtroom this morning, Andy. Just how unprecedented is this to hold parents of their child accountable for his crimes? Yeah, it's completely unprecedented, uh, Sandra. And it's it's actually, you know, your heart breaks for the parents of the, the children who were killed here. But you have to remember that the person who actually did the shooting got treated as an adult and was sentenced to life in prison. So it's not like the system didn't, uh, you know, carry out law enforcement against the person who actually did this. 
it's unprecedented to hold the parents accountable to something that they obviously didn't, um, you know, plan, agree to, participate in. I, I frankly just don't think that this is what the criminal justice system is for. I think the criminal justice system mainly is re should be reserved for uh, intentional wrongs. And I think it's more troubling here because Michigan actually attempted to or proposed passing um, child access prevention laws, which would prevent, uh, which would make it a crime for parents to negligently allow their children uh, to have access to firearms. And the legislature wouldn't pass that. So what happened here is the prosecutor made up a crime on the fly that the legislature had not opted to pass. Wow. That, mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that is something. So w w when we wrap our heads around that, he just said that the prosecutor made up a crime that the legislature refused to pass. So what that says to me, it has appeal written all over it. It absolutely could, but but here's the thing too, you know, now it's like the scale is right in the middle. They have been given the toughest penalty for involuntary manslaughter. So we are not saying that they pulled the trigger. We understand and recognize they did not. But here we go back, Sergeant Bill, to what you said at the onset, the vicarious liability, the omitting to act, the placing the, the handgun into the literal hand of a child who has mental health concerns and challenges and is exhibiting signs of not being well. So all of that, not getting the child help, seeing that he's reaching out, calling out, showing the signs. So we're in the middle here. It really can go either way. And I think the next 10 to 15 years will be um, pivotal to see how are they behaving or, you know, they could end up being the model inmates, right, while incarcerated. And if their time is lessened, then we will know that. But for now, you know, the conversation around the country that we're having right here is, is it the right thing? Is it just to hold these parents accountable because their son killed four innocent children and they didn't get him the help that he needed. This is from the chat, Dr. Debbie. What fuzzy doxy, what bothers me is if they tried the son as an adult, then how can parents be held responsible for a child? Just curious. That's the whole concept we're speaking about, fuzzy yeah. doxy. They're being tried via vicarious liability. Someone else commits a crime that they were responsible for, a child. But the child was tried as an adult and sentenced to I don't know how many life terms, right? Right. So that is the legal issue. And legal minds, a lot more, a lot more powerful and learned than me, are going to decide this, whether this will stand up to an appeal. And right. because this is going to become case law. Yes. Fuzzy, fuzzy, staying with fuzzy for a moment. Um, there's a good point made because therein lies another layer to this conversation, Sergeant Bill. How does the, the viewing audience feel about this 15 year old being tried as an adult? You know, that too becomes another controversial aspect. We have courts designed for juveniles specifically because of their age. And even conversations that I have with my college students in the classroom about issues such as this, two things are always looked at in order for this type of decision to be made. It's the offense, number one, and then it's the offender. So for example, if we look at five different people and we give these five people different ages, one is seven, 17, 27, you know, 47, 87. So that's the offender, right? But then we have the offense, the offense is murder. Do we want all five of these people to be um, processed the same way? What are we going to do with a seven-year-old who brings the gun to you know, first or second grade and discharges it in the classroom? No, you're absolutely right. And someone said the grand jury decided this. Uh, uh, whoever said, um, Deb Galloway, that's not true. Uh, the law is written by the legislature. And the laws as per juveniles 
and what crimes make a juvenile uh, allowable to be charged as an adult is decided by the state legislature. And then the grand jury just abides by the law or whether that person is indicted. And then we saw what happened. I want to continue playing this because this is a very interesting concept. First, let me go, folks, if you like real crime, true crime, from a police perspective, then you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, ring that bell, hit the like button, share us with your friends and your family. And if you want to contribute to us, we have a Patreon with three different levels, and we also have a YouTube channel memberships. We count them five different levels. And the channel's growing. You can see we have interesting guests like Dr. Debbie and uh, interesting topic, interesting discussion here. Let me play the rest of this because I think this is some of the most important issues that are coming out of this case right now. Andy, um, for our viewers to sort of take them back to some of the highlights of this trial, what led up to this day and this moment, this was some of the evidence that was presented along the way in the courtroom. Listen. This is the receipt from the gun store in Oxford for the Sig Sauer SP-2022 uh, 9mm pistol that was sold to James Crumbly. This is a picture of uh, the defendant's son holding the Sig Sauer SP-2022. I noticed that it, he had had some, some type of firearm training. This is about Jennifer Crumbly's actions. It's about what she knew and what she didn't say. James Crumbly did not know what his son was going to do. I mean, that is some of what we heard. And now there's this question of precedent. Um, there are some who see this and say, well, what does this mean? Is it, are we entering a new world where it goes beyond the person who commits the crime and more people can be punished? I mean, doesn't this open the door to a lot of possibilities in the courtroom here on out? Yeah, it's a, it's a Pandora's box. You're extending the criminal law to people who didn't actually commit the crimes. There's hostility, obviously, because there's a firearm involved, but no one is alleging that the firearm purchase was illegal. Uh, there are things that a legislature could have done here to, to criminalize aspects of this. They opted not to do that. So if you're going to have a system where you no longer have to be actually a participant intentionally in a wrong for the criminal law to apply to you, and the prosecutor gets to make up the law as the prosecutor goes along without mm -hmm. the legislature actually prescribing the laws, then, you know, all bets are off. Uh, and this time it was a gun. Maybe next time it's the parent who buys his kid a car, yeah. you know, or some other thing that's legal but can be dangerous if used irresponsibly. So who knows where this goes? But so you look some, at some of those emails, those red flags, I mean, that should have tipped off these parents that he was about to carry out yeah. this heinous... Uh, crime. Um, this was Paul Morrow earlier. He has sort of a, a contradicting look at this where he says, no, actually, this isn't so unprecedented and makes this analogy. Listen. This case has facts that are particularly egregious for the two convicted parents. Let's say a bartender who is over serving a customer who then goes out and drives that's a sort of a form of vicarious liability. And so it's the kind of thing that we've seen before. It's not unprecedented. Is that a fair comparison? Well, I, look, I think Paul's a very smart guy. And when I part company with him, I usually retrace my steps to see where I got it wrong. But in my view, having been a prosecutor for a long time, um, this is what you have a civil justice system for. I mean, these parents ought to be, you know, sued civilly and it's the reason that you get the kind of judgments that you sometimes see in these tragic cases but law but the criminal justice system is not intended to deal with tragedy what it's intended to deal with is intentional wrongs and i think if you take the step where you're now going to extend it beyond intentional wrongs then all bets are off and you don't know where it goes well they are the first parents convicted of u.s mass school shooting and um, the parents of those victims, man, your heart just breaks for them, uh, with yep. one saying about her daughter to the parents as we are awaiting the sentencing earlier to the judge, while you were purchasing a gun for your son and leaving it unlocked, I was helping her finish her college essays, and she is no longer with us. Um, just heart-wrenching. Andy, thank you for joining us on that. So, Dr. Debbie, so, so interesting, and I think, again, the legal part of this 
is for legal scholars to discuss this. And the uh, the host of this show said she incorrectly said that they were charged with um, uh, killing these students. They were not charged with that. They were charged with manslaughter through recklessness in, I guess, their acts that led up to allowing that. And that's, I mean, that's, I think it's a stretch legally. I really do. I would not be surprised. And look, I'm glad that they got convicted, but I would not be surprised that this case gets reversed on appeal because it's it's a slippery slope. It really is. It is, Sergeant Bell, but I think it's so intriguing that we're having the conversation that the viewers are engaged with us and I would respectfully disagree with the comment that was made by the attorney that our criminal justice system is only designed for intentional wrongdoing. I don't think that's accurate. I think that's why we have crimes that we have, which speak to negligence and recklessness and hence the whole concept of the involuntary manslaughter of which they've been charged. Their son is charged with first degree murder. That is correct. He brought the gun to school. He made the decision. He carried this out, the planning, the premeditation. That's that higher level of wrongfulness. But because of their, back to your terms, vicarious liability, omitting to act, failing to act, failing to recognize the signs, the cries for help that he needed, intervention, an interception and it didn't happen is now what they are wrongfully charged with, meaning their wrongdoing. It was wrongful how they behaved as parents. They wronged their son, which then led to the deaths of the four innocent students. You know, Dr. Debbie, I 100 percent um, agree with the parents getting charged. I just you know, playing devil's advocate. I don't know if this will hold up because one of the big problems with this, and I keep repeating myself, I sound like a parrot, um, is that whatever the decision is here, this will become case law. So attorneys and law scholars and Supreme Courts and Courts of Appeals are very careful with this stuff because when it becomes case law, it may not apply to every case. And that's the power of case law, that now this will set, we use the word precedent, this will set the precedent for the future. And you see up on the slide there, unprecedented. Yes. Yeah, this was oh. unprecedented that this was applied vicarious liability. We're giving a little class here, uh, Dr. <laughs> Debbie. Absolutely, it's a classy show. <laughs> We're giving a little class. And, you know, uh, again, the deep dive into the law um, it, it is is really, you know, vicarious liability. And we talked about omission, omission, the failure to act when you have a legal obligation to act. What better way to apply the word omission than to parents? Yes. Parents have a legal obligation to act. Look. As a parent, you have the legal obliga obligation to provide food, shelter, right, a yeah. and a certain amount of love to your children. I, I don't know if that can be written in the penal law, but, you know, you have an obligation, those, those three things, to provide food and shelter, education, all of those things. And when you fail to do those things, you are guilty of omission. And when you fail to recognize that your son has a mental health issue and you buy him a firearm. Yes. Wow. It's astonishing. It makes no sense. But I think these now become the conversations that will be had among parents themselves. I can assure you tomorrow morning, you know, around the, uh, the coffee table and, and parents dropping their kids off to school and conversing about this. How do you think this case, you know, should have played out? What do you think is the right thing? Is this going to impact? You know, at some point, Sergeant Bill, the, the needle has to move, right? In terms of we've got to take a look at our safety and security of our children. And when we have kids killing kids and we look at those kids who are the school shooters, 
for the mass murderers. I mean, these titles alone are astonishing and we just do not expect this to come at the hands of other children. But when it does, we've got to have the conversations of who's liable, who's responsible, what needs to happen to prevent this. Every child has a right to go to school and come home. They didn't come home. No, you're absolutely right. Do you remember Harris and Klebold? Of course, Columbine. Columbine, yeah. Yes. And that, the parents there were never really, well, they were questioned, but it was never considered. I, I would imagine that was probably over 20 years ago. I would think, I don't know the exact year, if mm -hmm. someone could look it up. But they were, they showed signs of dangerousness, of uh, the it's trench true. coat mafia. That's they were right. bullied by the jocks in the school. They had given indications. So that could have been, this situation could have been applied to that. And other situations too, when we see these school shooters that the parents had some warning of some apparent behavior and they either were not involved in their children's life. You know, look, they can blame it on a million things we hear it video games, you know. I was just listening to a Joe Rogan the other night. He had some Columbia University um, professor on who claims that teenagers spend nine hours a day now on their cell phone. That's pretty disturbing, I think, you know. It can be. It can well, be. We're adults, and we're guilty as hell, too. Maybe not nine hours, but uh, you'd be surprised that when you, your hours come back for the week or for the month, how many hours you spent on your phone. Right. And when you think you're a mind that is learning and growing and you're spending nine hours on it and some of the garbage, that's a French word for <laughs> garbage, you know, some of the garbage on a cell phone, TikTok, uh, all the crap that's on there and a, a mind that's being molded is spending that amount of time on a cell phone. Can a parent supervise that? Well, that's another conversation and, and what you're speaking to, there's a term for media parenting. You know, when we see five-year-olds on the phone and you're right, it could move into hours upon hours. Is the parent purposefully allowing the child to spend that much time? Because then it frees up the parent from monitoring and being involved and all that that takes. So a lot of this is multi-layered conversation, which again goes to what if any role here with this school and what went wrong on the part of school administrators, the, the, the guest who wrote in about not checking the backpack. That's correct. You know, what should we be doing moving forward from this verdict and this outcome, you know, pushing ahead to keep our kids safe in, at school? Is this the, the only school shooter that we will ever hear about again? Or might there be more out there? And if there are, what's happening? What should be happening? Do we need the school resource officers on site? Do we need metal detectors? Do we need to clear backpacks? See something, say something. You know, these are the conversations. All of the above. From the chat, Roseanne, their son's life is ruined and it's their fault. He asked for help. He just wasn't given it. Roseanne, you're 100% right. Pierre, by the way, I think having an unlocked weapon in a home with children is irresponsible. Pierre, I whole, totally agree with you. Sharon Reynolds, I'm so happy England doesn't have guns in the league of the USA. Yeah, you know, that's another conversation for another time, too. It could take a whole show to talk about the Second Amendment. Uh Miss Chris, one of the best things to come out of modern day tech and social media is awareness of poor parenting and how it puts children at risk. You know, Miss uh, uh, Miss Chris, I agree with it, but you know, I don't think kids should be on their phone that much. You know, I I don't think nine hours a day. That means they're not playing sports. That means they're not interacting with other human beings. You know, face to face. The socialization is gone. It's instead of an electronic object in your hand, which you could be playing games, you could be going on all kinds of different sites. Uh, Indigo Cupcake, I love that name. We have armed guards at museums, the White House. Should we also have them in our schools? It's sad to consider, but this is the world we live in now. 
Indigo Cupcake, many schools have uh, school resource officers that are in fact armed. And uh, sadly, many schools need that, you know, and uh, it, that's another topic for another show. Erica Olson, parents should be accountable. I think the Crumleys were not great parents. I think they underestimated their son's mental illness. So did the counselors in the school. No one foresaw his actions. Erica, you know something? We can never predict what people are going to do. We can get warning signs and we can intervene and hopefully prevent it. But no one knows uh, exactly what's on someone's mind. But, you know, there are warning signs. Uh, I love the comment always by that John Jay professor said, uh, Maki Haberfeld, she said, uh, someone's criminal history is a good indication of what they're going to do in the future. And I don't know if I quoted her exactly, but, you know, your record, your resume is a good indication. All of those things, what you do with your life is a good indication of what you're going to do in the future. Not 100%. You know, people turn their life around all the time. But in bad things like this, there are indicators that we cannot ignore. And in this case, it was ignored. Molly Colleen, oh, dear. I may get kicked out, but I'm going to disagree. I live in the area and have family members directly involved. Unaware? Yes. However, the community where I live wanted vengeance. Molly Colleen, I don't see this as vengeance. I see that this was the law, and they were arrested, and they were tried in a fair trial, and they were convicted. Is that vengeance? Uh, it was the law used? They got a fair trial. And as I said, and as the topic of this is, is vicarious liability and omission. Those are the two words for tonight, vicarious liability and omission. And there is a potential, as Dr. Debbie and I have been discussing in the last hour or so, there's a chance that this could be overturned on appeal. There, it really is. And you heard some legal minds discussing that earlier on. And, uh, you know, this, this is a case that everyone's going to be looking at because it's going to become case law. Uh, Miss Chris, I meant our awareness. I also agree kids' use of social media should be limited. For example, my niece didn't get Instagram until she was 16. She hardly uses it at all for her soccer, soccer and cheerleading. I guess that was it. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, kids should be allowed to be kids. And I think it's so important to have uh, social interaction. And when you're on the computer or on the cell phone, you're lacking, you're, you're losing that social interaction, which I think, and I'm, I'm not Dr. Cannon here, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just uh, Sergeant Bill here. Uh, I think social interaction is so important and it's part of the growth of a, of a, of a human being, and especially uh, adolescents, teenagers going up through high school. Dr. Debbie, what, what's your thoughts? A hundred percent agree, Sergeant Bill. For kids, for parents, there's got to be a balance. We understand kids want what they want. I think as parents, we want them to be happy. We want them to be healthy and well-adjusted. And if and when they are not, they need our help. And the help needs to be provided through unconditional love and support and whatever resources may need to be brought in. We see that it didn't happen here. Of course, the child interaction is critical. I think with Ethan Crumley, he was severely lacking. We don't even know, did he have a, a platonic male friend that he could sit in the cafeteria and have lunch with? You know, even something as, as obscure as that is really very significant in those years. So we don't think so. And I'll go back to a theory, um, Sergeant Bill, if I may, that I created actually applicable to the Idaho mass murder case is how and when and why I created it. And it's called JAR, J-A-R, Jealousy, Anger, Revenge. And I think it's applicable here. You know, we never really got to the heart and soul of why did he do what he did? I think we want to know that. And I think at some level, he may have been jealous of of other children who, yes, were involved and engaged in sports and music, dance, drama. We don't think he even 
had an after school activity in which he participated. And so then what? Then anger sets in that he feels apart from rather than a part of seeking revenge. And everybody wants to be noticed. You know, we, we have kids who certainly are moving through the elementary, middle school and high school levels where nobody knows who they are. Nobody sits with them at lunch and they're not involved and engaged in any type of interactive activity. And maybe that has to be looked at too, just some kind of activity for every kid, whatever it is, so that they feel a part of rather than apart from their own school community. I think you're 100% right. From the chat, Lori Blythe, some kids come home from school and go straight to their room and play video games the rest of the night. Yeah, that's the, the, those are the kids we're talking about. You know, the kids that aren't interacting with other human beings, and that's that's a dangerous thing. Sue M. Ethan was a misfit. His parents were aware, even they didn't want to sit and have lunch with him. That's pretty disturbing, right? Right. Uh, but she's right, Sue. Erica Olson, I feel deeply for the victims' families. It's always terrible when young lives are lost. One hundred percent, Doc uh, Lieutenant Peter Pranzo. He says, "Perfect, Doctor Deb." <laughs> <laughs> You got a fan in the Lieutenant yeah. Pete. Uh, Sue M. Ethan is a mental misfit. His after-school activity was plotting mass murder. They bought him a gun. They bought him 50 rounds of ammo, and they kept it unlocked. Sue M., you're 100% right. Uh, Sue M., as a bartender, Bill, I'm responsible for people over-drinking. Sue, you're right. I worked as a bartender for years, and I always felt that that was a huge responsibility to put on a bartender because – what are the levels? Uh, after all, you're selling alcohol, right? Legally selling alcohol. So what is the level of when most people, when they can't drive or when they would blow? If you if someone has two or three beers, they're over the legal uh, level to drive. Does that apply to walking? You know, does that apply to riding a bicycle? So what, you know, you're putting a lot of, responsibility on a bartender obviously if so, if someone's visibly drunk you shouldn't serve them period you know you shouldn't if someone walks into your bar and they're intoxicated you should say buddy i think you had enough i'm not going to serve you and I, I, as a bartender i know that's where all the problems come in when you cut someone off right they act as if you uh, insulted their mother you know um lisa he actually had a male friend he went bowling with. I believe the friend recently moved, but there were texts between them. Uh, Flyer B from the chat, in addition to the four victims, the other students and teachers are victims in their own right. Given the long-term effect this situation will have in their lives and those of their families. 100%. And you know what? At, at this point, I always like to uh, shout out to, to the to the victims. Uh who the victims are. Hannah St. Juliana, age 14. Don't forget this happened in 2001, so it's uh, three, nearly three years ago. She'd be 17. Tate Myra, age 16. Madison Baldwin, age 17. And Justin Schilling, age 17. You know, we, uh, we think about their families. We think about uh, all the people that love them and that they lost their lives in a senseless, senseless tragedy. Dr. Debbie, your final thoughts. Wow, my final thoughts. Well, first and foremost, thank you as always, Sergeant Bill, for the honor of joining you and, and to the great um, viewers for their interactions and their very thought-provoking submissions as well. Um, it's sad, you know, it's a, it's a sad case, sad, of course, the, the loss of our four victims, um, terrible to think that in our great country, we have experienced this despair and devastation in Michigan, where a young person decided to bring the gun to school to shoot his peers and the justice system, I think, has spoken and, and has spoken correctly within the framework of the law that the shooter himself received the four life sentences and that the vicarious liability, the omission to act that is um, 
you know, in the spotlight of the conversation today throughout the country about parents and their role, I think it was important to hold them liable, accountable. What comes next? We shall see if, as you're suggesting, it could be grounds for a successful appeal, maybe. But at least, you know, the needle has moved in the direction of accountability and making sure that kids can go to school safely and come home safely, and that is paramount. So I believe in that very, very strongly, not only as, as a criminologist, but as a mom. And um, I hope that we can see that every day thus far moving forward in our country. Dr. Debbie, you said it so succinctly, better than I could say it, but thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank and I you. know that Phil and Mike uh, always love when you're on the show too. And uh, neither one of them could make it tonight. So I got to have you all to myself. So thank wow. you so much for coming on. <laughs> Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm Bill Cannon. Have a great rest of your night and God bless. One episode, just ain't enough.